if, uh, if you're diagnosed with uh, carcinosarcoma and you're not a surgical candidate, yes. how would you be able to differentiate between an ovarian mm -hmm. and a uterine carcinosarcoma? It's a great question. A lot of times we would want to do advanced Im imaging studies. Imaging. Um, we would based be, on a pattern of metastasis? Yes. No, probably not based on a pattern of metastasis, although that might help. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you would want to image the pelvis very carefully. Mm -hmm. You know, our practice here, whenever I take care of a new person that has a carcinosarcoma suspected, mm -hmm. either of the uterus or of the ovary, I consider getting a PET CT. Oh. Generally up front. Generally with uterine carcinosarcoma, we know that the chances of having metastasis early mm -hmm. is higher. Okay. And so I do the PET CT to understand what's going on in the neck, the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And what the PET-CT will do for me is it will administer a sugar molecule mm -hmm. that's attached to a phosphor that would glow brightly in the PET scanner. Okay. And cancer cells are much more likely to take up sugar so that in theory things that glow bright mm -hmm. would look positive possibly, possibly for cancer. It helps me actually map out what type of surgery I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you can see abnormalities on the ovaries. You can see abnormalities within the uterus. For deep pelvic imaging, I will generally get an MRI. And sometimes I do both. Okay. Because I want to understand where does this growth appear to be coming from. We still see metastasis to the uterus. And even synchronous primaries. We see abnormalities on the ovary simultaneously with the uterus. Oh. And That's synchronous metastasis right. versus... And again, you can't tell, did this start in the ovary and go to the uterus, or did this start in the uterus and go to the ovary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is why we sort of use broad terms, like gynecologic personal mm -hmm. sarcomas. Mm -hmm. I think an important differentiation that you're getting at is treatment might change based on whether or not you have an ovarian carcinosarcoma sarcoma or a uterine. Yeah. Could you talk about that? So if you are diagnosed with an ovarian carcinosarcoma, could you take us through the stages of what you would... Yes, absolutely. When is it appropriate to have surgery versus when is it uh, not useful? Or you could just talk about all the, the different treatment well, modalities. If we suspect that this is an ovarian carcinosarcoma, mm -hmm. our treatment paradigm essentially mirrors that of epithelial ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. What we generally do is we do a good exam, we get good lab value testing, mm -hmm. things like CA125, mm -hmm. carcinoembryonic antigen, which is the CEA, and we sometimes get a CA199. Mm -hmm. And we do that for all of our patients with any type of epithelial or suspected epithelial ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll get imaging, because what we want to know is, are we able to do an upfront surgery or an interval surgery that will allow us to remove all the cancer cells. Sometimes ovarian carcinosarcomas affect tissues that we can't remove, and it wouldn't be safe to remove. And so I wouldn't recommend an upfront surgery in that setting. I would mm -hmm. want to give chemotherapy first. Mm -hmm. The standard treatment for an ovarian carcinosarcoma would be giving conventional carboplatin mm -hmm. and paclitaxel therapy. With regards to intraperitoneal chemotherapy, mm -hmm. this is a purely ovarian cancer modality that okay. we use. And it's invariably used when we do an upfront surgery, remove the vast majority of cancer cells that we can see with our eyes, mm -hmm. and then we put a port in either on the right or the left, and then we administer chemotherapy both in an IV as well as intraperitoneal in order to apply chemotherapy directly to the surfaces that are most likely to have residual microscopic cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In several trials, this was associated with both progression-free and overall survival benefits by giving intraperitoneal as opposed to purely IV. Okay. This is controversial because all of those trials excluded women with carcinosarcomas. Mm, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But our practice here is that we look at that and say, on a genomic level, ovarian carcinosarcomas appear to look like epithelial ovarian cancers. Mm -hmm. So we offer women intraperitoneal course, chemotherapy yeah. here. And I've personally taken care of women who have done very well with intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And they've had, you know, as excellent outcomes as what we've seen with, with non-carcinosarcoma 
epithelial ovarian cancers. Again, because we think it's probably a variant of epithelial serous ovarian cancer, which is why we see good responses. Interesting. So, but it would only be following a surgical procedure, correct? With intraperitoneal. With that, intraperitoneal. That's correct. So, and, and surgery is indicated stage one, stage two. At what so, point do you that's decide? interesting. A lot of times, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Okay. We will offer surgi a surgical procedure up front with ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. assuming their imaging looks like we can remove all the cancer cells. Okay. With stage four disease, when we see evidence of either metastasis within the liver in places where you can't remove, or... Within either, as opposed to a coating on the Right, side. as opposed okay. to a coating, correct. Uh -huh. Or we see chest disease, meaning mm -hmm. basically lung metastasis or brain metastasis or something that wouldn't be addressed with a surgical procedure in the abdomen, mm -hmm. many doctors will go ahead and give chemotherapy up front, mm -hmm. see a response in the chest or wherever else it is extra abdominally, mm -hmm. and then pursue a surgical procedure in the abdomen. Once we feel like these cancer cells here have responded Okay. and are shrinking and we have good therapy for that, okay. then we would want to actually cite or reduce is what we say. Mm -hmm. Basically lower the burden of cancer cells in any given person so that the chemotherapy can be more effective. Mm -hmm. What about a per periaortic lymph node metastasis? Would that uh, eliminate surgery or would that? No, no. it would not. Mm -hmm. And that would be true of both uterine cancer, mm -hmm. meaning uterine carcinoma sarcoma, as well as ovarian carcinoma sarcoma. Okay. A normal paradigm for me when I take care of women that have uterine carcinosarcoma is I'll get that PET CT, which will mm -hmm. tell me about the periaortic lymph nodes, mm -hmm. the pelvic lymph nodes, and then what I'll do is I'll do a comprehensive laparoscopic staging procedure, mm -hmm. which is where we remove the uterus, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the pelvic and the periaortic lymph nodes, and test them. We know that the rate of lymph node metastasis for carcinosarcoma is higher sometimes on an upwards of 40% of the time mm -hmm. with these high-grade carcinomas. Mm -hmm. And this helps us direct our future therapy because even with stage one carcinosarcomas, yeah. I recommend treatment with chemotherapy yeah. with uterine cancer, which is not true of other types of uterine cancers. We treat uterine carcinosarcomas differently. We tend to give them more chemotherapy up front in the setting of lymph node metastasis, we also apply radiation therapy. And this is targeted radiation therapy. And I think that's another major difference in paradigm between ovarian carcinosarcoma and uterine carcinosarcoma. With uterine cancer, we have a much greater experience using radiation therapy. And we know that that can be a very important adjuvant that can reduce recurrence risk. Mm -hmm. So, surgery, possibly intraperitoneal, chemo. For ovarian, correct. For ovarian, um, and then uh, chemo, ongoing chemo. Or and then we would do usually six cycles. We, in the Only six? In the upfront setting, we generally will give six to seven cycles of mm -hmm. chemotherapy for ovarian carcinosarcoma or uterine carcinosarcoma. And then we'll follow that up with some sort of an assessment, like an imaging study, to understand, is there anything left over? Is there anything residual that we're concerned about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we don't see anything, we like to stop therapy. And the reason for that is that we don't want to tirelessly do more and more chemo. There are some older trials that suggested doing more chemo, if there's no target, just exhausts people and decreases a woman's functional status so that such that if this were to come back, they may not be able to tolerate as much chemo. So a lot of times we think about stopping. If we see something, then we talk about additional therapies. Then we talk about changing things and seeing whether or not we should be giving additional therapies. But the thing is, it always comes back. It always returns. So that window that you have where you stopped chemotherapy mm -hmm. now gives those microscopic cells an opportunity to, to grow. Yeah. It, 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 
it, it's rare for it not to come back. Yeah. So I, I think, well, why not just have some ongoing maintenance? I think that's a terrific idea. Yeah, you're saying, but it sounds like what you're saying is it depletes the system. Well, so, you so a lot of maintenance strategies have been looked at. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. The, the real holy grail of oncology would be to give a medicine that gets rid of everything and mm -hmm. then give a less toxic medicine mm -hmm. that people can live on, mm -hmm. like tamoxifen mm -hmm. for breast cancer. That was a blockbuster because it, it helped women. Mm -hmm. They were able to take something that meaningfully reduced their recurrence risk. We haven't found that for any type of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. We haven't found that for any type of uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. And so carcinosarcoma, which are more uncommon versions of both of those things, are probably even further off from having something like that. Mm -hmm. And right now, the therapies that we do have, women can't be sustained on. Even something like single agent Taxol was looked at in ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that if you gave women a year's worth of single agent Taxol after finishing upfront therapy, you did delay any recurrence, mm -hmm. but you never stopped it. And when women developed that recurrence, it was unclear if they had enough reserve to do more necessary chemotherapy. And so you are bringing up the most important dilemma that we have. Well, mm. well the treatment failure and the recurrence rate is so high yep. with these cancers. Yes. Why not just start off with all guns blazing i mean it, it with a combination of you know chemotherapy immunotherapy mm -hmm. um uh, give it all give it all you got so it, yeah. it what do you got to lose i mean these women or you know most of these women are going to die well the you bring up a very good point and right now the paradigm for ovarian cancer meaning that we sort of have this clinical divide between mm -hmm. the ovarian carcinosarcoma and the uterine carcinosarcoma. Okay. And 50% of women with uterine carcinosarcoma have stage 1 di di disease, meaning it's confined to the uterus. 50%, um, okay. 50%. Because it's easier to diagnose can, can find, symptoms. Well, yeah, there, there's bleeding, bleeding early. Yeah. Um, but even though 50% have stage 1, in regular endometrial cancer, 85% are stage 1. I see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the majority of endometrial cancer as a cohort, yeah. the 64,000 women diagnosed with that, the majority of the 85% are stage one. But carcinosarcoma, it changes. But even those stage ones, as you said, have a much higher recurrence risk. Mm -hmm. So with stage one endometrial carcinosarcoma, we give chemotherapy and we don't do that for other types of endometrial okay. cancers. And so we do get more aggressive Mm -hmm. We also are more likely to give adjuvant radiation therapy. Okay. So those are the two modalities that have been most tested. And so we do tend to throw the kitchen sink at carcinosarcomas. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the clinical trials that have looked at this and have sort of lumped carcinosarcoma in with a group of higher grade endometrial cancers, what they've found mm -hmm. is that they haven't been able to meaningfully change the recurrence rate. Mm -hmm. Meaning uh, the kitchen sink we have isn't getting the job done. Mm -hmm. It's tiring women out. Mm -hmm. Women feel like they're getting hit by the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't appear to be moving the bar where we yeah. need it.